everybody. Good afternoon or morning, depending on wherever it is you are. My name is Cecilia Munoz, and I am uh, honored to be in this company and very, very excited to be helping host this event and this conversation today. Um, so um, while the whole focus of the event is to lift up amazing work that's going on, um, that's focusing on helping people access benefits, we are also here celebrating a new book, uh, which is called Power to the Public. It's a blueprint for how governments and nonprofits can harness the power of digital technology to solve public problems. Um, it was described by no less than President Obama as a good read for anybody who cares about making change happen. And I can vouch that that is true. Um, it, it is a, a, a great work and it's also inspiring because it shows how we can solve problems, even problems that we think of as intractable problems. And we have the authors of the book here today. So I'm gonna introduce them first. Hannah Schenk was one of the early members of the US Digital Service, and she's a founding member of the Public Interest Technology Program here at New America. Tara McGinnis was a senior advisor in the Obama White House. She recently ran the domestic policy team for the Biden transition, uh, and she founded the New Practice Lab also here at New America. And the way we're gonna proceed here is that the authors are gonna interview the state leaders and digital collaborators that they, write, that they wrote about in the book, who were part of a really important and inspiring transformation in the state of Vermont. Um, so one of those leaders, Genevieve Gaudet, is with us, the Director of Design at NAVA, building a more people-centered and equitable government. Um, prior to NAVA, she co-founded the New York City Service Design Studio in the office of Mayor Bill de Blasio. And because these kinds of partnerships need awesome government officials, we have Cassandra Madison, an experienced public servant whose expertise sits at the intersection of technology, operations, and policy. She's currently VP of Partnerships at the Tech Talent Project. And she spent the last 15 years helping to ensure that the big, that big ideas get implemented in a way that drives innovation, improves people's lives, builds a positive culture in the workplace. And Cass served as an appointee of Vermont Governor Phil Scott, which is how she enters this story. Um, but I want to start our conversation before I kind of turn the microphone, as it were, over to Tara and Hannah. Um, to start, I have a short conversation with uh, Sha Wang. Uh, he is the COO and co-founder of NAVA, which is a consultancy and a public benefit corporation, which is all about making government services simple, effective, and accessible to all. NAVA was kind of born out of the um, experience of rebuilding healthcare.gov um, after its troubled launch. Um, and now they work with uh, federal and state programs like Medicare, Veterans Appeals, Medicaid, and SNAP to improve their digital services. So we are very grateful, Shaw, that you joined us. Thank you so much for, for being with us. And I'd like to start the conversation with you just by asking the, you know, Tara and, and Hannah. Uh, have thrown themselves into sort of telling these stories about how delivery of government benefits changes. Um, I'd love you to just tell us, what, like, why is it important to tell these stories? Why is it, why is this necessary for folks to hear? Thank you so much, Cecilia. And and I, I before we get into that and answer your question, I do want to spotlight uh, your experience, Cecilia. Um, Cecilia Munoz served for eight years uh, as President Obama's senior staff, uh, became the nation's longest serving director of the Domestic D uh, Policy Council uh, before the White House. Uh, there are some longtime fans of yours at NAVA. Uh, she served for 20 years at the National Council of La Raza, now Unidos uh, US, earned a MacArthur Fellowship for her work on immigration and civil rights. Uh, in 2020, Cecilia published an award-winning book, More Than Ready, um, a book for lessons, uh, lessons for women of color on the rise. Um, and now Cecilia is a senior advisor at New America, living in, living in Maryland. Um, I, I wanted to pass on uh, really some, some gratitude and admiration. I'm uh, actually one of the executive sponsors of Juntos, uh, which is our Latinx uh, employee resource group at NAVA. Uh, and so our leads, Mario and Vanessa, wanted to share a really deep appreciation uh, and admiration for your time and work uh, through the decades. Um, so again, you have some, you have a lot of fans at NAVA. Um, That's so and, nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think to go to go to your question, why is it important to spotlight 
um, and share some of these stories that uh, are, are both challenging and rewarding. Um, I think the I think the power of the narrative and the case studies that Ta Tara and Hannah are bringing here um, are, are showing really the difficulty and the patience required, uh, but also the impact uh, and the practices and the shared lessons uh, that can be taken forward. Um, I'm reminded of uh, a statement that Sarah Shulman made, uh, who is a kind of historian uh, and author who interviewed uh, hundreds of folks involved in ACT UP, uh, the kind of uh, uh, AIDS uh, awareness and activist group uh, that was active during the 80s and, and 90s and still today. Uh, she put together this uh, collection of narratives and, and oral history of the group and what she said, uh, which resonates here too with uh, the, the work that Hannah and Tara are trying to spotlight. Uh, she says that, uh, that, that uh, focusing on heroic individuals or these kind of uh, shiny, glossy, heroic narratives, aside from being inaccurate, uh, can mislead contemporary activists away from the fact that in America, political progress is won by coalitions. Um, and and I, that resonates very deeply with the roles that I think NAVA feels like we have to play in this space, the roles that organizations like New America have to play, and the varied, I think, perspectives and, uh, and, and stories being shared uh, through uh, power to the public, so it, it's it's incredibly important, I think, to uh, to shine the spotlight on on both the challenges and the rewards here. Thank you so much. That's a um, it's a wonderful way to get us started. And I should just say that 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 uh, Nava has big fans at New America. I think that's part of uh, part of the reason that this is that you are you all are a character in in, in the book in a sense um, because there's a good story to tell here about how we can how we can do a much better job of reaching people and, and accomplishing what the government sets out to accomplish, accomplish. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for being here with us. Um, and with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Tara and Hannah to, uh, to lead this next part of the conversation. And I hope that folks who have joined us will start thinking about your questions um, because we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a conversation with all of you as well. So Tara and Hannah, over to you. Thank you so much, Shah. Thank you so much, Cecilia and Shaw. I think in particular, um, I'm going to jump in right away and make sure that for folks uh, who are grounded and who we're serving, we start right there. But I, I hope people can see that the mission of the book and the event is to show how many types of people and uh, just as Shaw, um, you know, I think underscored that this takes a kind of village of different folks who lead companies and folks who lead domestic policy councils and um, design directors and storytellers and important, important public servants of um, all different levels of leadership. And I think hope, we're hoping that you see a number of us here that um, if you're listening at home, uh, you see a place for yourself. Um, there's many different um, ways to put your hands on making change. But I want to start with the people we're serving and, and Genevieve, maybe just we're going to go into a deep story about Vermont. But before we go narrow, just take us a step back from your broader work on government benefits and why does it matter? Yeah, well, I think it's important to start that when we say government benefits, certainly at NAVA, we're really talking about services that support vulnerable populations. And this can mean healthcare beneficiaries, veterans, low-income families, you know, the un or underemployed, um, folks with disabilities or experiencing homelessness. And it's pretty difficult to understate how broad of a population that is. I believe Medicare last year served 44 million folks, SNAP around 40 million, Medicaid I think is in the 75 million. And, you know, just in the first few months of the pandemic, uh, I think about 45 million Americans ended up claiming unemployment insurance. And so we're talking huge swaths of the U.S. here. Um, and that's certainly, you know, why NAVA is focused there, because these services have the size and the scale and complexity that um, when we improve them, we're able to have a really big direct impact. And we're also be able to tell, you know, a really credible story about um how government is capable of, of meaningful change in serving people's needs on a, on a reasonable time scale. Um, so, Kat, 
Ross, why don't we start with um, let's let's get in let's dig into the story here. Um, so, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how got how the state of Vermont got involved in this integrated benefits project um, in this idea to trans to streamline um, or simplify how people apply for benefits? Sure. Um, and and first, let me say, too, it was such an honor to be a part of this book and to work on this project with Genevieve. I feel like I've been inducted into this family of public interest tech, um, and it's a really wonderful community, and it's an honor to be a part of this story as it unfolds across the country. Um, so in Vermont, setting the stage. So when, when we got involved in the integrated benefits project, the state was really on its third attempt to, in a, to implement this integrated eligibility system. And I'll put system in quotes because it's this unicorn we had been chasing for 15 years. Um, the idea was if you are a Vermonter of which nearly a third of the population is, is receiving some sort of Medicaid benefit, so a huge swath of the population. But um, if you want to apply for a benefit program, whether it's SNAP or fuel assistance or Medicaid or even health insurance coverage through the health insurance exchange, you should be able to visit one website, call one call center, fill out one application. Um, and the previous iterations, you know, really relied on this big bang approach to delivery. The intention had been to sign one contract with one big vendor um, and to do all the planning and implementing in a really linear way. And because of a variety of reasons, which we can get into, but you know, you think about project complexity, budget size, um, the fact that we were continually prioritizing documentation over working code, the project could just never get off the ground. And a bunch of dollars would be spent on planning and then it would be canceled. So we were on attempt number three and we were really determined to do something differently didn't really know what differently meant at that point in time um, and really decided to partner with some of the organizations across the country like NAVA, Code for America, 18F, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, who were really helping lead the charge and helping governments think about delivering tech differently. Uh, we knew what we were doing before wasn't working and this became really an opportunity, um, you know, a doorway to change and to partner with some organizations that had some tools and principles and practices that we thought could be really promising and that turned into this, this document uploader project. Can I ask you for one second, like, how did you, how did you come upon these, these friends? You were in Vermont. What was your role? What were you doing before we jump into the experiences of uh, the way the Affordable Care Act maybe informed the Vermont experience? Just like, tell us about um, the kind of really the state, the state perspective. Sure. So I guess the helpful history here is that I, you know, I had worked in nonprofits for a long time. I joined government as a policy person right at the start of, in 2012, when the state was implementing its health insurance exchange. And I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and optimistic about all the great ideas we had about, um, you know, we'd even talked about the health insurance exchange sort of being the gateway to single payer in Vermont. We were gonna give everybody health care um, and just had this front row seat to what happens, um, no offense to policy people, because I am a policy person at heart, but what happens when you have policy people in charge of implementation? Um, and um, and it really all fell apart. And so the history of the integrated benefits initiative starts in a really difficult failed project. And um, you know, for as bad as it was on the outside, people's perception of it, it was way worse on the inside. Um, you know, customers, the stories of the customers who couldn't sign up for benefits or who couldn't pay their bills or who couldn't change their information in their accounts were gut wrenching. And not only that, but staff were stressed and they were at their limit and they were in tears every day because they were getting yelled at and there were endless backlogs and they felt helpless. And then they went home and saw their employer on the news. So it was just a bad situation all around. And quite frankly, I just started jumping in where I was needed. And it turned out I really love operations. I really love tech implementation. But so so my searching for something different came rooted out of the, the sheer pain of that experience. And, you know, it took us years to get out from under that and to stabilize things and to gain the public trust. Um, and to this day, I don't, I think when you say Vermont Health Connect, it's still, it's, 
it still has a negative connotation and I don't think we'll ever get out from under that. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think somehow I stumbled upon like the code for America conference and that just like started, started me down this path. And I realized, and I think I said this in the book that a lot of the things that I felt intuitively, like, why are we doing such big projects and why aren't we thinking about our users? I realized that like, oh, there's a methodology out there and there's a language and there are people who are thinking about these things. So, you know, we really said everything that we we did, we're not going to do that again. We're going to do the exact opposite with, with integrated benefits initiative. And that's where we really started to say, like, we're going to take, we're going to prioritize our users. We're going to take incremental approaches. We're going to implement modern tools and practices, and we're going to evolve constantly as we take in new information and gather new experiences. And so, you know, this document uploader project with Nava really became our first small step with a user centered, like agile project um, to really help us turn our IT delivery model on its head. So you fell down this rabbit hole of um, this CFA HNF public interest technology rabbit hole, um, and uh, you sort of come in it. <laughs> still in it, right? Fair, still in it. Um, and in the in your rabbit hole, in the rabbit hole, you um, you meet Nava, and as you mentioned, so the um, plan uh, was to start small. Um, with this document uploader, um, Genevieve, can you talk a little bit about uh, what was the what was the thinking on the Nava side around um, starting small? Yeah, um, and I want to I want to shout out that uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that if Cast wasn't open to it in the first place. So certainly that that willingness um, and the partnership from Vermont was really critical to to doing anything. Um, and also that, you know, on the ground, when we were first looking for um, problems that we could solve, you know, on a reasonable time frame, um, Code for America and the Center on Budget were, were partners in that work to identify um, what were possibilities, you know, we could bring to CAS and say, like, here are a few problems that we think we could solve. Um, and the uploader came out of, uh, you know, a very rapid um, sort of site visit discovery period where we interviewed folks along the delivery path um, in Vermont. And, you know, everyone from CAS to the folks at a field office who are who are meeting, you know, Vermonters every day and helping them process applications. And it came forward that um, getting documents, so like maybe a pay stub or um, proof of, of where you live or proof of who you are to the programs so that they could process your eligibility uh, was a very manual process, both for the staff who are um, actually kind of determining eligibility and for the Vermonters who needed to submit them. So you could mail them in, you could bring them in person, um, and all of those are expensive um, and are problems that we can solve pretty quickly with technology. So we knew that if we started with this, we could provide real value to the state, to Vermonters, and we could do it very quickly to get some momentum behind, you know, Cass's vision that this could be very different. Can I ask you, I think this, this question of momentum that Jimmy raises is real <laughs> um, for folks in the work. And can I ask you to talk about buy-in? Um, you've been to the Code for America conference. There's this, I, there's a story about really taking a demo to the floor of the Vermont State House. I don't know if that was the first ever demo uh, day in the Vermont State House, but can you talk a little about what it takes to bring a whole state or team along? Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is one of the reasons why I love the story in the book because it's not a fairy tale, right? Like getting buy-in is really difficult and some things went really well and some things were really hard. And I think there's lessons to be learned in it. Um, when I think about buy-in, so first things first, like the great starting point that we had was there was literally no one, whether it was the legislature or the frontline staff or the executives that thought the way we had been delivering technology was working. 
So if you can agree there is a problem, that is an excellent first step. So that was an, an easy box to check. Now, agreeing on what the cause of that problem is or what the solution is to that problem is, is much harder. Um, and so for us, there were really, I would say three key stakeholders. One was my leadership within the Agency of Human Services. Um, that was actually pretty easy because they had seen me in the trenches and our team in the trenches on Vermont Health Connect and had lived through some of that pain too. And so I think because of that leading that turnaround, I was lucky enough to have, um, you know, their trust and support that had to be built over time. The second key stakeholder um, was the legislature and uh, that was actually, it was challenging, but not unmanageable. Um, because again, they also had all of their constituents calling them when Vermont Health Connect failed. And so they were ripe for change. And talking to them about tackling projects in smaller increments, aka reducing budgets, um, and focusing on delivering working code that would actually make people's lives better instead of endless planning resonated with them immediately. And even, you know, with the incremental approach, for example, like right away, we cut our budget from $36 million to, you know, $13 million. So um, it was an easier sell. I think the biggest challenge we had was within, within our own agency of digital services, which was essentially our centralized IT. Um, and I think right there, you know, there was some new leadership that hadn't experienced the pain of Vermont Health Connect. And like what happens in a lot of government is, you there tends to be some infighting at times about like who's in charge and who's going to make decisions and that can really you can get in your own way um and so i think one of the big lessons learned is like the need for that executive alignment and and buy-in which i know we'll get to later but um speaking of the demo i think looking back on it the single most effective thing that we did was to, to turn the tide with stakeholders was to show them a product that works and you're right we had never done that before um and in some cases we had never produced working code before. Um, so in the case of the legislature, like they were so used to us promising to deliver something and that day never coming, that with the document uploader, we brought together the four committees in the Senate and, and the House that were critical to approving the funding for the project. And we took time to explain the overall approach to them. And then we demoed the product. So we gave them a fake pay stub and the link to the uploader, and we had them actually use it themselves. Um, and even the legislature legislators who had some challenges with technology um, were able to use the uploader, and they were blown away, uh, not only because the technology itself was simple, and it was not fancy, like this was minimum viable product situation, <laughs> um, but it was simple, they could use it themselves. And then we were able, because we were already piloting it, to immediately show them stats to say, this is how it's improving people's lives. So, you know, we've piloted in this place. Um, we see, you know, X percentage of people are uploading documents outside of regular business hours. The average time to eligibility in the pilot went from nine days to four days. Like the impact was immediate. Um, and it was really a game changer across the board and became the model for how we wanted to do everything going forward. Like no more big launch days, we're gonna pilot everything and we're gonna show people code that works. I love that story. I just also love the visual, the image that that conjures of like going to the state house and doing this demo. And um, it's, it's just, it's great. Um, so uh, can let's back up for a moment um, and uh, talk a little bit about the pilot, which you said was at, at this point was already running by the time you uh, demoed it. Um, so uh, Genevieve, can you talk a little bit about, um, so you started this pilot, it was in the Barry office with 50 people. Um, why, the Bar why that office, why 50 people? Yeah, uh, well, in the book, as you mentioned, that office had Jimmy, who um, was a supervisor there, who was not only willing to let us, you know, sort of do this in the first place, but was also um, willing to, to sit with us to collect metrics, right? That's the whole point of running a pilot is to see, does this even work? And um, 
Because of the way some of the Vermont systems were set up, we knew we needed to collect those metrics manually. Um, and Jimmy was excited enough and invested enough that he was willing to sit down with us and go through every single case that had used the uploader to collect the, the metrics that Cass just mentioned then. And then the 50 comes out of, you know, it's, I think anyone who works in government knows that launching anything is terrifying. It is scary to put working technology out into the world. It's why we pilot. And we wanted a number that was big enough that we could get metrics that people would believe. You know, if we did five people, it was it would be like, oh, that's not really enough. Um, but we didn't want so much that we were going to terrify our stakeholders. You know, we didn't want to put Cass in the news again. Um, but we wanted to be able to prove that it worked, that we could reasonably measure it. Um, you know, and, and get a big enough number that we could build the case to actually rolling this out to other offices if it went well. Um, and it turned out it did go well. <laughs> so can you bring us up to speed? Like, what, what is, where is it today? I know um, uh, book publication takes a while. So um, tell us about the state of things today. Yeah, so uh, at the end of that pilot, what we were able to figure out, um, in addition to some of the things Cass already mentioned, we saw that over half of people were sharing their documents with the state uh, within 24 hours. Um, and only about 10% of folks had been able to do that before. So this means that um, about 10% of people who had gotten a request for documents were either were probably driving physically, uh, taking their documents by hand into an office. And then we expanded that with the um, launch of the uploader to 55% of folks could get their documents within a day. Um, because of that, as Cass mentioned, we were able to drive down the time it took to get a decision. So it was about like 45% faster. I think, and then we saw um, some other interesting ones were uh, about half were coming from phones, which is great. Folks aren't having to like go onto their computer to do this. Um, and about a third were outside of business hours, which just wouldn't have been possible at all. And so using those stats, um, we were able to then roll it out to a second office. Um, and in that second office, we worked really closely with um, our product owner, Thani, who is also mentioned in the book, uh, to kind of um, work with her staff on that second rollout so that uh, any future rollouts could actually be handled by the Vermont team. So they could do the training, they could talk to the caseworkers. Um, and after that, it just sort of kept rolling. And now I think it's rolled out to all of the, all of the regional offices in Vermont. Um, and so this story has um, a, a coda, though, um, to uh, on the end of it, which is that, um, and I don't want to speak for you, but um, I, the obviously when you run a pilot, the hope is it's going, it's the first step in a very, very long process, um, a long modernization process of moving forward. Um, can you talk a little bit about where the project is um, as of today? Short sure, was that question for me. <laughs> sure. So after the uploader project, uh, Nava also began to work with the state of Vermont on combining the applications for um, the the uh, the integrated benefits um, program, which included uh, the healthcare programs like Medicaid um, and economic services programs like SNAP. We started with Medicaid, um, but because of some procurement issues and kind of some of the issues that Cass had mentioned, uh, we weren't able to continue that, though I believe, uh, like all integrated benefits and long-term modernization initiatives, I believe the state is restarting some of that work now, which is very exciting. Um, Cass, did I get all of that? I already capture that right? So this is such an interesting conversation and it is also, it's really so affirming. It's like lovely to see how the story turns out. Um, uh, I wanna remind folks, so there's some folks who have put questions either in the Q and the Q and A or the chat. Um, we're gonna start to ask them. So uh, please keep the questions coming. Um, I wanna start though. So this is, an, this is a story specifically about Vermont. Um, does, um, do states, 
I mean, at some level, every state grapples with its own versions of the same thing. Um, are there ways that these kinds of lessons move from state to state? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you, how do we get to a place where things are going more smoothly everywhere? And Cass, you unmuted, so let me turn to you. Sure. Um, I, I think um, pausing on lessons learned is really important here. I think um, the power of the Vermont example is that we're able to show that working differently produces better results. So that's a really exciting baseline. Um, I think the, the two other biggest takeaways, I think for me that I think are helpful for other states, one is just, and this comes out in the book, like the need for executive alignment is critical because you need permission um, to be able to do things differently and, and know that at all levels of leadership that, that folks have your back. Um, the other big thing I think is that could be helpful for states is trying to share lessons on how to work with vendors appropriately. I think a lot of states are struggling with um, entrenched vendors and vendor lock-in. And when you start to shake things up a little bit, um, it's hard to get your entrenched vendors to play nice in the sandbox with new faces. And there's really no leverage to be able to do that. And so I think one of the shared lessons is for states is, is how to work with vendors more effectively. And I know ATF is doing a ton of work with procurement, which is really helpful there. And I think organizations like New America, like Code for America, um, can be uh, conduits of, uh, you know, of information and bring states together um, to be able to share what's working and what's not working, which can help move everybody forward. Um, and I think it, you know, we're doing it pretty well at certain levels, but I think it needs to happen from the executive level all the way down to, to sort of the frontline staff um, and, and really create those communities and share those best practices. Thank you. And I'd love to open this up also to Shah and Genevieve, right? Because you work with a variety of states and you work on a variety of programs. Um, I mean, there's a logic to the idea that if you build something in Vermont, you should be able to use the same thing in Montana or somewhere else. Like, does that hold true in your experience? Like how do these things move around or do they move around? I think what we've seen is that the, the needs of, of constituents or beneficiaries and even the needs of state staff don't change so much from state to state, um, but sometimes the implementation of the technology does because you need to, you know, make it work with whatever system is already up and running. Um, and, you know, Nava makes a specialty of that. Um, but yes, in general, you know, folks need to upload their documents in Montana, maybe even more so than in Vermont, because I hear Montana's really big. Um, you know, and so there are, there are a lot of lessons to be learned there. And I think that's really exciting because it means that we don't need to, you know, we don't need to do this the same research all the time in every state, but we do need to be able to um, to kind of translate it to to the technical and operational needs uh, within each state. Thank you, Shai. Anything you want to add? Um, no, just to I mean, just to plus one everything that Cass and, and Genevieve said. I think. Um, one of one of the founders of the UK's government digital services, uh, Ben Terrett, uh, used to say things like, uh, "Bad services are nouns, uh, and good services are verbs." Um, you know, we can get caught up in the nouns of these programs of which acronym does which things which way. Uh, you know, how does Medicaid define a household? How does TANF or SNAP? Uh, and there are so many nuances, uh, many times for good intentions and good reasons, uh, adapting to the needs, needs of these specific programs. Uh, but when you pull it away and when you step away from the acronyms or from the nouns of these things, what you come back to are some really shared verbs, like uploading documents, uh, verifying identities, uh, you know, kind of confirming, you know, uh, uh, validating uh, household information or submitting uh, income uh, information. And when we're kind of for us at NAVA, I think we're trying to kind of carve away back to those, uh, those kind of common verbs um, and being able to kind of validate or invalidate the, uh, the things that, uh, that are common across different programs because this document uploading is not just you know, relevant for health or economic programs. 
uh, it's also up, uh, relevant in, in many other situations. So I, I think it's, it's hugely valuable. And I think that that internal tension that Cass pointed to of, um, uh, of kind of uh, some of the silos uh, or, or kind of entrenching of ways of working, um, I think uh, can, can often be kind of uh, productively upset um, when, when coming back to these lived experiences and these, these kind of common verbs. That's a really, really lovely and interesting way of thinking about it. Thank you. All right, so we have quite a number of questions um, from the audience. So I'm gonna start with one from Kara. From a civic tech perspective, how do you balance disrupting the status quo by offering tools that operate outside the system, which may feel like fast solutions, versus working with state agencies to transform the system, which is, feels more like sustainable solutions? Thoughts, Genevieve, you look like you're, like you're pondering the question. I guess I, I don't think of them as all that different. Um, offering tools that operate outside the system versus working with state agencies. Oh, are we saying, I, um, I wonder if this question is sort of looking at the difference between tools like maybe um, Code for America's Get Cal Fresh, which has been hugely successful in getting Californians food assistance versus um, maybe working internally with an agency like we're talking about in Vermont. Um, I think our community balances us in that way. Uh, we need a diversity of of solutions. And I think there are some things you can do outside of state systems um, to really speed up, you know, or draw attention to certain issues. Um, but, you know, personally, and I think at NAVA, the approach we're taking, um, which is not better than uh, the, not better than its sort of counterpart, is that um, long-term sustainable change uh, needs to happen within agencies because that's where we have the lever to kind of impact um, operations and culture and these supporting technologies that, um, you know, can really drive uh, outcomes that I think government is accountable for. Cass, I see you nodding. Anything else you want to add? Just plus one to Genevieve. I think there's a, uh, you learn very quickly that there's no one size fits all in government. Um, and that some of the fantasies we have about just like build one thing here and it will magically work everywhere else or, you know, or it's just harder in practice. And so a diversity of approaches allows you to try things and then amplify what works and move away from what doesn't. And that's harder when, when you try to do things in a, you know, just pick one approach and go with it. I'm just scanning to see if anybody else wants to dive in. In which case we will go to a question from Paul. Agency CIOs and CIO offices and the effective delivery to modern government digital services helping or hindering? Like what, what role should agency CIOs, CIO offices play, especially in states? Any thoughts on this, Cass? I definitely have thoughts. Um, I think the role is monumentally important. Um, you know, I think you need you need the technical leadership and the business side leadership to be working together um, to be able to do things like change strategy, prioritize users, et cetera. And you really have to be aligned on business goals. You have to be aligned on how much room you're gonna give folks to experiment and try things differently. And when that alignment um, doesn't occur, you can really, you just end up tripping over yourselves or swimming upstream and it makes things harder, harder than it has to be. Um, and I think there are some great examples across the country, well, at the state level, level and the federal level of CIOs really um, leading this charge and building cultures within their agencies that are modern and are willing to take risks. And I think we need, we need much more of that. Thank you. Anna or Tara, do, do you want to add anything to that just from your experience within government? You were both alumni at the federal level. Um, I'll add that I think the way agencies are structured right now, the CIO um, office, it's a make or break 
um, scenario, depending on who's who's in there for how services get delivered. Um, whether this things need to be structured that way, I think is a good question. Um, but I agree with, um, I think, you know, with Cass's assessment and um, it it's very, very dependent right now on who is in that, in that seat. Fair enough. Okay, a question from Brendan. How do you sit, set up for success across new political leadership and administrations? Alaska was part of the uh, Code for America Integrated Benefits Program, but things stalled with a new governor and a new administration. Um, Tara, do you wanna start on this? I'm happy to. I mean, I think this is, this is the challenge. Transformational change often takes a while. And so um, I think you can see with a panoply of different folks here, um, if, uh, if your project resides exclusively in the political architecture, um, it's unlikely to sustain itself. This was a big challenge for us in the Obama administration. Um, I spent a lot of time with Cecilia in the final years, really making sure that the table in which ideas can be surfaced includes both folks like the CIO who might not be there where the kind of problem is put at the center of the table, but also um, longstanding career leaders and frontline workers. And, um, you know, often if the project is branded with one uh, political leader, it can lead to challenges. But if the practice is shared um, by folks in the, you know, in the Bari office uh, where that you, you change a bit of practice change, I think you have the opportunity um, to keep things going. So I think individual initiatives, Brendan, um, can be challenging, but I also think if you are doing something that's mission critical and you want your name it, city, county, state, agency to do for a decade, and you're, and you look around and can see only one of these categories, political leaders, uh, career leaders, um, outside technologists, a single vendor, then you're not building the web for change. Sometimes you can have all of those things and still um, get stuck. It's part of what we illuminate. But I do think really being broad about where innovation comes from and um, being, uh, you know, having big ears and listening for the idea that you may be coming to the table with, may, someone else may have tried and failed a decade ago and have lessons uh, learned from the front lines to be shared. Thank you. Anybody else want to dive in? Um, one thing I would add to that is that I, I, I know this isn't true everywhere in the country, but probably true in Vermont that um, political leaders can come to technology begrudgingly. It's not, you know, or something that they fear because they don't understand. And if you can get to a place where you're delivering technology regularly in small increments and it's working, you're much more likely to be left alone to just keep things going, right? If you can keep keep the stories out of the news and keep services improving, um, it, it's a good way to just be able to, it becomes a part of your day-to-day -day operations and that's the goal. Instead of a big project that we're all gonna like take time out on and wanna know the status of, that this is just your incrementally improving technology. It's a part of the, your day-to-day -day business and how you run your operations. Um, and and it's just a part of running good operations and it, it can allow you to weather the, the political changes more easily. Can I also add, I think this is why we saw in the Integrated Benefits Initiative that it was so important to start small. We saw that a lot of the water that would be carried across administrations was carried by, um, you know, frontline folks or people who weren't political appointees. And so, you know, having something like the uploader live and running means that's not going to go away. Whereas like maybe the big unicorn master person management project is just not the priority anymore. And that one sort of fades off into the, to the, you know, the, the legacy of the agency. Um, so it's, it's not so much a setup uh, question, but it is, it is one way to see see these projects kind of continue because you've already delivered the value and because they are, as Cass said, kind of in the DNA of those operations. Um, so there's another question. They're now like flowing in, so I'm struggling to keep up. But there's a question from Natalia that I think relates to a conversation that we started here, which is how beneficial is it when states like California contract out to private companies to provide better services? Is it sustainable or effective compared to change within government agencies themselves, right? This is a tension that we, that we deal with. 
thoughts about this? I'm happy to touch on it a little bit. I think the, um, I think in addition to what Hana you said around the CIO's uh, office or seat being make it or break it, um, frankly, what we've seen in our experience is that too too often the agencies themselves do not have um, the funding or the resources or the in-house um, kind of talent pipeline to uh, to do this themselves. Um, and that's that's a incredibly uh, that that's a real problem, right? Uh, where um, not only is uh, the then then you're not only kind of outsourcing uh, to vendors uh, some of your uh, work, but you're also beginning to outsource the literacy and the oversight and and frankly the accountability uh, about when things uh, don't deliver the outcomes when you don't end up, like Cass mentioned, with something to demo. Um, that, that's actually something uh, that, that's pretty important to NAVA is that uh, the government, this is why we do work for the government. We believe that these agencies and programs should be able to keep the promises that legislation is making to the public. Uh, and that's why we actually, um, actually endorsed uh, a bill that Senator Wyden and Murray introduced uh, a few weeks ago uh, around funding state, uh, state and local digital service teams. So I think that's a, you know, there, there are decades, I think, of underinvestment or things like uh, Office of Technology Assessment or Congressional Research Service uh, that have kind of uh, dwindled over the last couple of decades. But I, I, uh, I am encouraged and excited by, uh, you know, California's uh, Office of Digital Innovation, Colorado's Digital Service, uh, Connecticut, I think, has a digital service team as well. So this type of renewed investment, I feel like, creates, uh, pulls a lot more agency, to use an overloaded word, back into the agency, right? Um, uh, which I think is where it, where it should be. Uh, and then if there are folks like NAVA who can help agencies accomplish or make accelerated progress against their mission or pull from other experiences from elsewhere in other programs or other levels of government, then great. Um, but but the mission does need to live in the agencies and not be outsourced. I see vigorous nodding. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read a, a comment that was sent to the panelists, which relates to a question which got sent in by somebody else. So Jennifer just wrote, I love most that Nava and Vermont focused on the most vulnerable, those who are historically marginalized. Too many approaches do whatever was done in the private sector and backlog what they refer to as the nice to have, which is so flawed. This shows what's possible when we prioritize those most in need. Thank you for this approach. So I thought I would say that out loud and it connects to a question from Sonal. How do we incentivize vendors and government to be more explicit about bringing an equity lens into government and IT projects? How are outcomes being measured by race and ethnicity? So thoughts on this question? Um, well, I would say, I think one of the things that we um, try to make uh, visible in the book is that if you do the things that we are showing that other people, uh, other teams have done in the book, like engaging the community um, and looking at real-time data and talking to users, um, that part of what is wonderful about those pieces um, is not just that you get a better product that actually serves people, um, but that you get a product that serves everybody's needs um, in whatever form those needs might take. So if um, you really are digging into actually who are the people that we wanna serve and how do we best serve them, you can't help but have an equity lens. Um, we do also talk about one of the things we discussed in the book is that teams who, um, prioritize bringing people with the right lived, with the uh, applicable lived experience onto their teams also benefit tremendously um, from that point of view and having that perspective on the team. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Tara? I think, you know, um, this is really pronounced in a bunch of our work. I might just lift up um, unemployment insurance where, you know, uh, 
Black and Latinx workers face a greater challenge receiving unemployment insurance than their white counterparts, while they're overrepresented in the unemployment data. 78% of, um, of uh, white workers make up 50% of the unemployed workers, but 78% of UI re recipients and Black and Latinx workers make up 40% of the unemployed workers, but less than 20% of the recipients. They're, they're, um, it is often really difficult to tell how well we're serving people when we can't disaggregate data to see how well we're serving people. And so I think um, I lift up the unemployment insurance example because it's truly pronounced and some of it is uh, very old as to who was cut out of the policy from its origin in our labor laws. But some of it is baked into very technical things, work that we've been doing with Marina Nitz in California. There are a bunch of American names that cannot be recognized <laughs> by government uh, unemployment you know, insurance system. Cecilia, I think you have one of these two character last names. We may have a few folks. And so if you, if you test to this um, critical question based on a John Doe user and not on a four, you know, four names, two of which are the same, then you invisibly lock out a bunch of people. So I think the, the kind of threads of which are structural and the threads of which are technical get intertwined at some point in time. And this is a space where we have tremendous opportunity, but I do think the, the kind of data lens, the, as, as Genevieve raised, like basic collection and see how we're doing for these 50 people does often reveal um, we can't see the barriers we're putting up for subpopulations. And so can't underscore how important this is in our work at the lab. Um, and really, you know, the importance of diverse teams at the state and local level reveal the kind of um, invisible challenges you wouldn't see if it's a team of John Doe's, no one might think about two character last name. Yeah, so I will just say yeah. that this this person with two first names and two last names, which is a very Latin American thing, and I has never found a government form that gets along with my name, is very grateful for that perspective. <laughs> but Cass, I stepped in front of you, sorry. No, thank you. Um, I would say in Vermont, uh, we needed to do better on this. So I will fully admit that. Um, I, a couple other things that come to mind for me, one is that working with advocacy organizations in the community that really know and have trusting relationships with vulnerable populations is was really critical and we needed to do even more than we did. The other lesson learned was, um, you know, the importance of pairing the business process work with the technology because technology for a lot of groups isn't going to be the answer. So when I think about the document uploader, we were able to see that pre-document uploader, 50% of the traffic in our district offices was just people dropping off paperwork. And if, if half of that 50% really wanted to be able to do it on their mobile device, that is great. And that would reduce traffic in the district offices so that folks who had trouble um, navigating the electronic systems, whether English was a second language for them or they had a disability barrier, then they could go in person and they would have much more space to be able to have their needs met. So I think when we, it's hard not to get enamored with technology, but it's important to remember that that's not going to solve everybody's problem. That is a very convenient channel for a certain part of the population and you still need to pay attention to how you're going to serve up other people for whom that is not uh, the the primary channel that they you know trust or can interact with amen amen to that so i have like a bunch of other questions like teed up and ready to go but we're also running out of time and i want to give each of you a chance to answer a closing question and this is right the, the proverbial but, you know, if you had the magic wand or a few minutes with a senior government official that wants to address the challenges of benefits delivery, like what is the most important thing that, 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 that this person should focus on? Like what's your best nugget of advice or the thing that you most want those government officials grappling with this stuff to know? And um, I'm just gonna go across my screen, but so let me start with you, Cass. Um, I would just like to play back for everybody Shaw's last answer, because that's my answer, <laughs> but it's, it's worth repeating, um, that talent to me is the biggest issue. Probably not surprising, because then I left the state of Vermont to decide to join the Tech Talent Project, which is all about inspiring people to serve in government. Um, but I really feel that delivering better technology is impossible without the right people in the room. And we need government leaders and teams at all levels with 
um, empathy, curiosity, commitment to mission, and modern technical expertise. And I think to Shah's point, like time and time again, government seeds not only the delivery or the development of the technology, but the strategy and the oversight and the decision making to vendors. But as a government official, you cannot outsource risk. So when things go wrong, I promise it's still going to be you in front of the TV cameras. It's still going to be you in front of the legislature. And so I would love to see um, government leaders internalize that and really invest in talent. And I think it's not just in bringing in new humans, although we need to do that, but it's also in um, investing in the civil service and upskilling people so that we can meet the needs of 21st century technology and service delivery. Thank you so much. Tara. I will plus one the talent, plus two the talent, and also add, I think, um, I think if the project you're aiming at is about, is like the goal is a, Uploader, the goal is a website. Then, um, then we've missed the opportunity to center on people, and I think, um, and you know, really making sure that clarifying this is incumbent upon those of us who are in the tech translation or tech work. That if you get too far afield on the on the pathway to increasing access, um, that you often can get really lost. And so, I'd say, like, uh, on the checklist manifesto of government benefit delivery. If your headline goal doesn't involve clarifying very clearly how you help humans, go back and work on the headline goal. Thank you. Shah, how about you? What's your nugget of advice? I, I'm, I'm feeling a, a little nerdy and lame getting stuck on something, but uh, I can't get it out of my head, so I'll share it. Of um, that, that agencies should understand that they own the systems. Uh, that, that have been either built for them or built by them, um, that, that there are contractual ways that people can exercise accountability, but too often feel uh, disempowered. It's too often, frankly, an abusive relationship um, between vendors that have all of the technical expertise and control uh, when and and then Cass, like Cass mentioned, the the agency is actually the one that holds all the risk. Um, so I, I uh, that that from my perspective is such a um, it, it's such a degraded dynamic uh, that I would really love to be inverted and kind of reset. Amen, Genevieve. Yeah, plus four to everything everyone has already mentioned, I think one phrase that Cass said, um, to not get enamored with the technology really stands out to me. I think I would pair that with Tara's coming around orienting around the outcomes, like pick one outcome that you really want to impact and then use the simplest tools with the lightest connection to just put something into the world to try to solve that, you know, and it's often just like, the, the, the simplest, least sexy technical, you know, approach that you can take is probably going to get you the outcomes that you need and, and you can build from there. Thank you. Hannah, the last word goes to you. Um, I would um, ask them to come with me to the benefits office and apply. There you go. Nice. This great, great and thoughtful way to end the conversation, which is a really, really terrific conversation. Participants, you will have seen in the chat, both links where you can purchase your copy of Power to the Public, but also links to a survey because we wanna hear your, your thoughts about the conversation today. Um, thank you to part our participants. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists, not just for a great conversation, but for the work you do in the world, which could not be more important. Um, we really appreciate you. Thanks for being here and we will close out.